democratizing AI, AGI, at this point, um, it's taking a life of its own, but open source, as you just saw in the previous talk, um, is, is making the waves, uh, is taking the lead as well. Like math, um, music is like math, and like music, math is a generational wealth of our species. So I think we believe that um, math and AGI belong to the community, to the open source, to, to people. Um, and I think that's kind of how we've th thought about open source. Open source is freedom, uh, not just free. It really democratizes. Uh, it's really awesome to see .ai. We were one of the earliest .ai domains to begin with at SH2O. And it's great to see the ubiquity of uh, all the transformation. Open source really defends off community with code, right? So if you think about last year, same time around, uh, actually beginning of last year, there was only a few open source models that you could even count that were doing well. Today, open source models have come of age. And today, defense of community is with AI. And I think AI is so uh, important, we want it to be in almost as much in public domain as possible. And why LLMs? Um, the journey of LLMs is quite interesting, right? As data scientists, most of us were 100% passionate about data. And then by the time we really get to the boardrooms, it's really about stories and storytelling. Hopefully, as grandparents, we're only telling 100% stories. So LLMs are really good at storytelling, and that's a very super, that's a superpower that tra truly transforms our space. If there's a few things that I would usually have on my slide deck, it'd be time is our only non-renewable resource. And nothing um, uh, amplified that message straight than uh, COVID, right? Sort of, um, uh, there's a few things. Um, we saw, I think the last presentation started with moat. Um, I think customer um, and community love is still the greatest force. And customer is indeed the moat. So if your user community is your moat. Over the years, H2O has fostered an incredible amount of community. Um, and I would say we are home to the largest uh, Kaggle grandmasters. I don't know how many of you know Kaggle. Um, about 30 of the 10% of the world's Kaggle grandmasters are uh, working as makers and collaborating with us at H2O. And so what do you do with them? You, you bring incredible innovation uh, with them. And I'm going to jump quickly into that uh, topic. Uh, there's a key piece I was going to say, where are your uh, intellectual properties? Uh, it's really prompt, right? Sort of, so your prompts, and almost, I mean, great to see uh, France uh, taking the lead in a lot of the open source movement. Uh, and I think that brings an additional voice. I come from Silicon Valley. Uh, we don't want to have a single point of failure there. Um, so, I mean, it just goes on and on. I think the democratized AI movement is truly really getting into the AGI space. And so I'm going to kick off with kind of a couple of things. What, how do you measure AGI? Um, and I think um, the Gaia benchmarks, so we run Gaia benchmarks every night on our own enterprise platform. Uh, as you can see, uh, Claude is leading the pack with some of these uh, benchmarks here. Uh, but the open source wave is not far behind. It's really the uh, Quen, Meta, they're not too far behind in terms of uh, the Gaia benchmark accuracy. So, um, so that's one case in point. I was going to also um, quickly showcase a few pieces here, since we are uh, at the computer. Um, so this is, um, so we have um, open source LLMs, right? So Danube, um, let me just click a few slides here so you can, so we can trigger, trigger, uh, uh, trigger through. So Danube, 1 billion, 2 billion, 4 billion parameters, open source, open weights model. Um, now, I think the, the trick to this one is going to be very um, simple and fun. So let's say, how should um, um, Paris uh, use generative, generative AI to foster um, AI community for its citizens? Again, this is an easy question. You might have asked it a few times. What's interesting about this is now we're going to go completely offline. And, um, and I think, ask this question, and I think what you're going to see is um, kind of a, a truly on-device LLMs, right? So the on-device LLMs have come of age. And this LLM is actually running 
completely uh, natively, right? Sort of for you uh, on device and beginning to see how kind of the open source LLMs, small LLMs, so the rise of the small LLMs. Um, and I think um, the good, good thing about this um, of, of the phone is it's now essentially, uh, and it's not an iPhone um, newer one, it's an older phone. It runs on um, Google um, so, uh, as well. So the LLMs now running locally natively, and you can see the rise of the small LLMs, um, no longer a, a super secret, um, the SLMs. Our teams built this model um, in a, a fraction of the cost. Right? So it's being state-of-the-art minus three to six months means you can actually build these models really uh, super simply. Uh, so um, again, a very small team uh, with about six trillion tokens. So it's not a small affair, right? Sort of we're using a lot of AI to do that uh, labeling, AI to do the data cleaning. So a lot of um, really algorithms helping you build the models. This pro the advantage of a small model is you can absolutely now um, deliver a super high punch. You can fine tune these models on small hardware, right? Sort of so everybody can truly start building this. So the half a billion, two billion, and four billion parameter models um, that we released uh, earlier. And every season, we are releasing a model. So that brings me to the next model we are um, uh, going to talk about, which is um, as yet unreleased. So it's, we are kind of in that cusp of um, announcing it. Um, so document AI is how we came to LLMs. And for years, we worked with enterprise documents. And ML-powered applications is how document AI v1 was. And you can see that ML powered apps have a very high um, kind of technical debt, right? As data changes, you have to rebuild all the pipelines. Uh, then came Document AI v2, which was LLM powered, from ML powered to LLM powered. And I think this is a metaphor. Most of your SaaS applications are going to go through the same transformation. And from LLM powered to actually a purpose built LLM, LLM for that problem. And that's what we're. Um, bringing out as um, uh, Mississippi. Um, we're naming our models after rivers. And I think the future evolution of this is you're going to use an agent to call these specialized document AI or other uh, purpose-built tools. And we're going to demonstrate some of the tools there. But the uh, characteristics of these models are you're trying to do ML to do prompt tuning in the LLM powered, which is prompt tuning. But I think as you get to the LLM uh, as a whole, right, the VL, uh, visual language LLMs, you're basically able to do a much more um, uh, simpler architecture. Um, here are some of the characteristics of this model. It is obviously one of the world's best in, um, in its class for text recognition on OCR bench. Uh, and I think it's beginning to kind of slowly surpass many of its class models, and it's also batting somewhat above its class in some of the classic bigger benchmarks. Uh, in some cases, intern VL 26 billion is behind um, the H2O VL Mississippi. Uh, you're going to see that uh, release uh, almost in a few hours, and uh, this is probably a pre, uh, early pre-review uh, of that. Uh, again, how we built it, how the team has built, um, brought a really uh, a very good punch, if you will, to the, to the mix, and you're going to see um, some of that talked about in full detail. Uh, in the paper. I think one of the interesting aspects is the team actually found that combination of the, the CNNs, MLPs, and um, the transformer architectures can really, truly give you some really superpower on trying to focus. Uh, the, I mean, purpose-built LLMs, SLMs, and fine-tuning them, and learning the a a art of fine-tuning them using LLM Studio, which is another open source platform that the team has released. So, so that's the other, um, I would say, um, really round the corner VL LLMs, VL um, uh, models that are right there. Uh, there's a need to improve our benchmarks. A lot of benchmarks are floating around with this uh, test and train uh, somehow being mixed. And, and I think uh, we saw with MMLU Pro and a few other um, benchmarks. But I think improving benchmarks is something um, most, so they can start building trust in LLMs, trust in models that are coming out. So let me um, uh, showcase how we are doing some of our own benchmarking. Um, our platform is actually rolled out as an app store. I'm gonna go, don't, I don't want to go deep into that much as much, 
But uh, even though we have our own LLMs, we support almost every other uh, model. So you can see the model ecosystem across live, actually. So you saw stat you typically you see static um, uh, charts on this. This is a live chart where you can run a quick test and see how, what is the, uh, how each of them are doing across a representative workloads or benchmarks of our customer base or our user base. And I think that's kind of what we would like to encourage most of our customers themselves as they promote different LLMs to pick the ones that matter, uh, pick the workloads that matter for them. If you're building an HR assistant bot with a lot of flow charts, then create a test case that's similar to that as opposed to testing public benchmarks. Again, um, this is another, uh, like, not all models can be deployed on-prem, so open source models can go on-prem, especially in air-gapped environments. Many of you are, uh, are innovating in that space where large LLMs can't come. I think that's another uh, space you have. Um, the, the convergence, right, sort of for if, if we were, uh, if we were um, looking at a, uh, almost four years ago, you were probably doing a predictive AI um, kind of if you were trying to solve, this is actually a Kaggle contest, um, uh, predicting Walmart weekly sales, which is actually a typical uh, problem in time series. Um, this is the uh, classic Kaggle contest, right? Sort of uh, the, the, a few years ago, our customers would be calling something like this and start building models, continuously doing feature discovery and building um, uh, kind of that um, feature transformations, uh, hyperparameter tuning and all this classic auto ML. Uh, what today's customer would probably do uh, with uh, with, uh, with the combination of generative and predictive is actually issue a prompt right from the same Kaggle contest. Um, let's do this here, uh, and then using uh, obviously I was mentioning earlier you can use different LLMs. We're going to ask it to pick one for us. You can also ask it pick one by uh, cost, right? Sort of like cost of an LLM. Um, uh, what are you willing to pay for accuracy? What are you willing to pay? Are you latency as well? But in this case, we'll just ask it to use agentic stuff and see what it does. So, so the idea here is, of course, uh, I also wanted to talk to uh, talk to me while it's doing it. So I think um, so. That's the um, you can start. Of course, profit is a popular package. Uh, you don't have to use um, any proprietary packages, but you actually can, as you can see, it starts d doing some data prep, starts doing some pre-processing, um, figuring out what a day in the life of a data scientist is. You're bringing predictive AI and generative AI closer to each other is actually are intertwining them together is where we're seeing a lot of the low-hanging um, innovation, if you will. Take an LLM um, and use um, machine learning to improve um, improve uh, the pre-ML phase or using machine learning to use the post-LLM phase. Both the places you see a lot. Uh, one of our um, top customers in uh, at and they're using um, phone for uh, call center optimization. The actual call center classification problem can be solved with the SLM. What you're seeing here is absolutely um, kind of, it's not only building code, so the superpower of AI agents is actually code, right? So as it does that, um, I'm going to actually launch another um, Another chat here. Um, obviously, RAG, agentic stuff, all of that's now fully intertwined, right? Sort of, so you can essentially, um, let me just open one more here so you can actually let this run here and go into a different problem. So, uh, I mean, classic, right? So, classic compare stocks. Let's get a, um, again, similar, uh, similar, I mean, you've seen demos. One of the things that we are seeing in, in, interest, in the interest of um, kind of public uh, announcement, right? Time to first demo is so awesome. How to get to time to first uh, production? That's actually still a steep learning curve. So as you think about how you can help uh, further adoption of AI, uh, tool chain that can help customers go, go from demos to a production, that phase where uh, putting enough rails, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it guardrails, but rails, so agentic stuff, 
looking at all the various travel cells. Uh, every run is actually a data point for future learning. So we're collecting a lot of that data, so then you can start going back and fine-tune or post-train your um, both the LLM side as well as the ML side. So um, I think we are at the end of this one. Um, I, I'm sure you've probably seen the typical um, rack and pieces, so I'm going to uh, kind of leave this for, um, yeah, so, so that's, I mean, we're beginning to see a little bit more confidence, consistency in agentic stuff, still a reasonable um, um, pain point, right? Sort of how do you can bring that consistency, uh, what models, how you can start tuning it to, to get that kind of stuff. Um, the other um, piece where a lot of innovation is going on is a, uh, evaluations. How do you evaluate your models? Um, and I was talking about benchmarks earlier, right? Sort of so, how do you start building um, kind of even more uh, confidence around the different um, uh, LLMs, but also embeddings, uh, data, so from the data to the embeddings to the full life cycle, right? Sort of how can you bring um, uh, purpose built evaluations? And I, there's a whole uh, platform, um, both open and closed, that's out there. I'm sure you're building things like that, Eval Studio. Um, uh, and using um, essentially uh, AI to kind of uh, be some of that um, uh, a partner, right? Sort of, so I'm going to show uh, a, class, a, a workflow on how we are using AI to do auto prompting. So if you do a bit of fair bit of auto prompting and expose weakness, in the past you could assert conceptual soundness of LLMs. These days we are not able to do that, right? So we're, because LLM surface area is so large, we are exposing weakness of the models as opposed to um, uh, using the soundness architecture, which we would have um, done in the banking sector or in the traditional ML um, pr predictive AI world. Uh, I'm going to scoot over to kind of um, talking about a couple of things that are dear to us. Um, we started the company because we, we believe that uh, AI is a force for good, right? Sort of so, so any uh, and, and the idea we, in 2020, our quote was uh, one person billion uh, dollar companies will be formed, right? We're beginning to see the rise of that, and people are beginning to believe it. I think AI is a true co-founder for you, so I think um, this is going to be a super, super force for good. Um, and I think we've actually uh, used this as a kind of a metaphor to work on wildlife, uh, endangered species, um, wild meat. Uh, we're working with several um, open source and NGO projects as well, uh, but also um, kind of wildfire, bushfires predictions, right? So there's a lot of AI for good um, work that the team has been um, truly um, building out. We would love to kind of encourage community to um, participate and join in the traditional AI for uh, good um, pieces. Um, a lot of apl simple applications. One of the applications um, uh, was um, able to predict flooding and uh, the, the recent flooding in. Uh, in, in the U.S. Um, was uh, caught a lot of people by surprise, but the predictive AI models were quite um, powerful in trying to predict that much early. So in, in general, I think using AI uh, to do to more good. Um, and, and I think I was going to say that in general, I mean, this is the, this is the time when AI with a great force uh, gr comes great responsibilities. And how do you kind of uh, raise a whole strong ecosystem around us that will bring that kind of... Um, um, force for I mean, using AI to be a force for good. Uh, I'm going to jump quickly and say that data is actually a Sanskrit word, right? Sort of so, uh, and I think it, it was to give, to impart energy. And AI is going to usher abundance. I'm sure there are a lot of um, uh, talks about how AI can take away a lot of things. It is going to usher abundance in time. Most of us will have productivity gains. We're already seeing that. Uh, with agents and, and um, LLMs in marketing. Simple use cases in marketing are going so far, but in general, you're going to have abundance of space, abundance of inner space, thinking space, and outer space. Um, and when I say about time, and when you think about time a lot, uh, a million seconds uh, is about 11 days, right? A billion seconds is 37 years. 
So with, with every, each one of us is capable of producing roughly a billion thoughts, if you think about two words per second, billion prompts can attach to a computer, can now produce, with AI can produce incredible amount of um, richness. AI has already started eating many of the technologies we know. AI is on the verge of eating SaaS right now, and AI has recently eaten all the Nobel Prizes as well. So this is just the beginning of the big space coming ahead. Uh, and I think the, the unfortunate challenge of our time is, like, just like a long, long time ago, the problems of virus uh, wars and fake news is still a big problem. So I think using AI to make a difference is really what um, we, we should all um, aspire to in .AI. Um, thanks for having us here. Um, I mean, I usually uh, end my quotes with this will be fun, but I, I would say that um, it's incredibly humbling to see every day the amount of innovation coming out of uh, San Francisco, uh, globally, Paris, um, uh, and every city in the world at this point is fully activated, even uh, across the border, right? So we see incredible innovation. Um, I usually am um, on stage, and so I'm going to um, kind of ask for uh, a, a selfie as well. Thank you.